Stand by and. Hello, my name is Christopher Anderson Bazzoli, and I am a composer, a conductor, an arranger, an orchestrator, and a music copyist. Now, that might sound like a lot of jobs, but it's actually quite typical in the music industry today when you're talking about creating music for the symphony orchestra. And it's not uncommon for any professional working in that field to find themselves doing all those tasks uh, in any given part of their career. So I'd like to start by talking about my very first experience uh, in the music business. I grew up here on the Monterey Peninsula, but I've been in Los Angeles for the last 30 years. And shortly after I got to Los Angeles, I had the good fortune to meet the then newly designated music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. His name was Esapekka Salonen, and uh, he was not only an amazing conductor, but he also was about to write a major work for the orchestra called L.A. Variations. Now, when I met him, this had been in about the mid-90s, this was a time when composers were starting to transition from writing music by hand with pencil and paper to creating music in music notation software. And I just happened to be there at the time when Esapeka was trying to make that transition, and I had already spent a couple of years doing this and was reasonably facile at it. So he hired me to be his music copyist for this big new work, L.A. Variations, he was writing for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. So the question is, what is a music copyist? The music copyist is the person who's in charge of taking each line of a composer's score, let's say the flute line, the French horn line, the cello line, etc., and making it into its own individual part for the musician of the orchestra to play. Now this is a big job involving thousands and thousands of notes and lots of proofreading and uh, lots of players. So I was lucky enough to do that for him and actually LA Variations has become something of a modern classic. In the last 20 years, it's had hundreds and hundreds of performances. And uh, so I was really honored to be a part of that. I continued doing this music copying work, uh, working on film scores for the major studios in LA. I got lucky enough to be part of the Walt Disney Company on several of their big features. Uh, all of the Pirates of the Caribbean series, lots of uh, Pixar films, including the most recent one, uh, Incredibles 2. It was released just this last month. So uh, it's been very fun to work as a music copyist. Another of the composers I was working for at the time was a gentleman by the name of Jay Chataway. Now he is well known for doing a lot of the music for the Star Trek television series of the time, Next Generation, Voyager, and um, the final iteration of that particular show, Star Trek Enterprise. So I had been working as a copyist for Jay for a number of years, and he eventually asked me to become his orchestrator. So what is an orchestrator? The orchestrator is the person who does their work right before the music goes to the copyist. Now, in a concert piece like LA Variations, there wouldn't be an orchestrator. The composer would be the orchestrator because he or she is in charge of, of uh, doing all the details of the score for the full ensemble. Now, when you're talking about film scores and video games and other things like that, uh, there is a lot of music to be written in a very short period of time. So often a composer will have to kind of divide up that labor. And so the composers often come up with a kind of shorthand. Now, in the old days, that would have been a couple of lines sketch with all the necessary details of the music in it that then they would hand off to an orchestrator who would transfer all of those markings to the full score that'll be used by the conductor for the recording of the orchestra. But these days, most composers do all of their work in a digital audio workstation. Uh, we, they're called DAWs, or we call them DAWs in the, in the music industry. And this has a couple of purposes. They write in the computer so that they can demo what the orchestra is going to sound like for whatever client they're working for, whether it's a video game or a film. 
And so once they're finished with that process, that's the file, they call it the MIDI file, that they can hand over to the orchestrator who takes all of that information and creates the actual score. Um, there can be a wide variety of what an orchestrator is asked to do. I've heard stories of some people getting cassettes with uh, you know, the composer singing a melody into it and handing that to the orchestrator to finish the score. But composers like John Williams these days, they still actually do pencil and paper. Uh, and even though it's a very condensed sketch, it has every single little detail of the orchestrator for the orchestra to be able to transfer it to the, to the full score. So that can run the gamut. So I also had a wonderful experience working as an orchestrator for several albums. I've worked for artists like Michael Buble, Christine Aguilera, Dr. Dre, and uh, also most recently the musical duo She and Him. And they consist of uh, singer-songwriter M. Ward and the actress and singer um, Zoe Deschanel. In that particular case, I was already working as the orchestrator and the copyist, and so I was offered the opportunity to conduct the orchestra for the recording. So this was uh, something I had a chance to do in school and had conducted some of my own music for film scores and that sort of thing. So I took up the job, and uh, it's been really exciting being a conductor in the studios, which is a, actually a little bit of a different job than it is if you're a music director of a major symphony conducting a concert of Beethoven or something. When you're in the studio, you're dealing with music that the musicians have never seen before. So you're rehearsing it in the moment. It's also music that was probably just created, perhaps the night before. And so it often involves a lot of changes that you have to make on the fly. In the studio, all the musicians are wearing headphones with either backing tracks of the song or a metronome click to keep everybody in sync. The conductor also has this. So the conductor in a recording studio is a little bit uh, different than other jobs. You, you're acting a little bit more like a producer. You're there to listen for mistakes, make changes on the fly, and essentially run the recording session with the orchestra. So this conducting gig that I fell into uh, recently kind of climaxed in this wonderful uh, experience I had with the amazing uh, actor and comedian and writer Harry Shearer. He recently resurrected his role as the, uh, Derek Smalls, the bass player from the uh, cult rock band Spinal Tap, and made a new album that he called Smalls Change. But in addition to his giant band, he also uh, hired an 80-piece orchestra to record arrangements with his songs, his new songs. So uh, in addition to doing the arrangements for the album, I should stop and say that arranging is a little bit different than what I referred to as orchestrating before, although they're very similar. The arranger has a little bit more creative leeway to come up with, to actually compose melodies and to come up with rhythms in different parts for the orchestra that enhance the song that they're working on. So I got a chance to do that on Small's Change, but when it came to doing the live shows, uh, Derek and or Harry put together a giant band and uh, hired the Louisiana Philharmonic for a, um, a performance at the Sanger Theater in New Orleans, for which I got to conduct my first major live concert, and that was just this last April, and it was a huge thrill. So everything I've talked about with my experiences so far is essentially me utilizing my skill set to, to try to help other artists achieve their vision, other artists, other composers. So now I'd like to move um, to my own work and talk a little bit about the film scores that I've done. 
In 2003, I had the great good fortune to um, participate in the Sundance Composers Lab, which is put on by the Sundance Institute, which uh, puts on the famous film festival every January in uh, Park City, Utah. And this was a two or three week uh, intensive where you work with Sundance filmmakers from their filmmaker lab. You have mentor composers who are quite famous names working in the field today. And you have agents that come and it's just a really terrific program and I actually recommend it to anybody who's interested in this field that they should apply. Through that experience with the Sundance Lab, I started going to the festival regularly and I met quite a few filmmakers uh, who I ended up collaborating with. And since Sundance is known as a kind of an international organization, at least the film festival is, these ended up being films from all over the world. I wrote the music for a film called Ellipsis from Venezuela, one called Without Snow from Sweden, one called Kunjo from India, and the very first narrative feature film ever to come out of Panama, which is called The Wind and the Water, many of those of which were, were featured at the uh -huh. festival. <sighs> Ella me dijo, Roma. Yo sé que parece una locura, pero en ese momento todo cambió. Yo sentí que me hablaba al revés y me decía, amor. Amor. Claro, tú me estás diciendo que tú te enamoraste de una mujer. Claro, tú eres gay. ¿Él es gay? Sí. Bueno, Galo, yo... Lo único que te puedo decir es que... Bueno, que sabes con esa mujer, pues. ¿No? Así de pronto te olvidas de Marcelo, de una vez por todas. La lleva dos años muerto, ¿no? Carlos, eso que tú tienes ahí es una herida. Y te la está cosiendo el doctor. Pero la de aquí, brother, esta que está aquí, es más profunda. Y es la que te está matando. Y tú no lo quieres entender. Mejor nos calmamos, señores. Doctor, le queda un poquito de anestesia para que le ponga él. <risa> Seguro. <risa> Mira, a ver si respetas la memoria de Marcelo, ¿no? Además, lo de ella no es así tan fácil. So when a composer is collaborating with a filmmaker, this can be a very delicate business because we all know that music has such a profound impact on a filmmaker's work and the story that's being told that there's a great deal of trust that's involved when a director hires a composer to write their score. In the case of the film Ellipsis, I worked with a Venezuelan director named Eduardo Arias Nath. And in that particular case, he brought me on quite early before he had actually shot the film. So all that I knew about was the story that he had told me and the script that he had written. Now, in most cases, a composer will come in where the film is shot and uh, it's being edited and the sound designer is doing their work and they're replacing dialogue and doing all the other things that are involved in post-production. And the composer usually has anywhere from a couple of months to sometimes a couple of weeks, if you're unlucky, to try to put together a, uh, a score for a film. In the case with Eduardo and Ellipsis, uh, I had a couple of months to come up with ideas inspired by his script and inspired by the stories he was telling me. So, um, I was able to come up with a couple of pieces of music that he liked that he ended up playing for the cast as he shot the film. 
to give some sense of the emotional notes that they were going for uh, in the final product, which is a huge thrill for any composer. Um, now, as far as composing, I'd like to just end by talking about um, a concert work that I've written recently, and it has a very strong Monterey Peninsula connection. Uh, it's called Continents End, Nine Poems of Robinson Jeffers, and it's a song cycle for mezzo-soprano, voice, and piano. And uh, those of you who will, from the peninsula will probably recognize the name Robinson Jeffers as the great kind of official poet laureate of Carmel and the builder of the Tor House, which is a local landmark. But having grown up on the peninsula, I really connected very strongly to the poetry that he wrote about the area. And this became especially strong after I grew up and left the area and moved to Los Angeles, a much, much different landscape as you can imagine. But I would always return to Jeffers' poetry because it reminded me of the beautiful locale that's here on the peninsula and uh, a lot of the, uh, the just the themes of, of surfing on the beach that he would write about or going hiking in the, the forest that he would talk about. So I connected very strongly with the poetry. So now uh, I finally came around to getting interested in, in writing my own piece based on his poetry. And when you do that, you generally start by finding a, a presenting organization or an orchestra or uh, some performing ensemble, even an individual artist who you want to try to collaborate with, write, write it for and present with. And in my case, I went to a, um, a one of their yearly conferences of the Robinson Jeffers Association. And I presented them this idea to write this piece and I thought, uh, they might be interested in presenting it at a future conference, which they were. It turned out that the president of the organization at the time was a, uh, a classical musician and a bassoon player, and he loved the idea. So um, as I went to write the piece, I did it in a way that I hadn't done before, which is that I did a lot more vocal improvisation than I normally do. I'm normally at the piano or at my guitar working on a piece. Uh, in this case, I actually just turned on a tape recorder, I memorized the poems, I went in and I sang several different versions of each poem just on the fly with no accompaniment, just to get that immediacy uh, to the music. And with the miracle of technology, I'm actually able to take that recording, fly it into the computer, tune myself up, create different rhythms out of it, study the notes that I had sung and what I had done, not really knowing in the moment what I was doing exactly. And so in that case, I felt like I was able to find a, a happy medium between kind of this left brain immediacy and kind of right brain uh, um, craftsmanship. So the premiere happened in, uh, in 2012 at the Butterfly Church, uh, which is down near Asilomar Beach, and uh, to great success, I thought. And um, I actually, most recently, this last year, made a recording of the piece uh, with the mezzo-soprano Buffy Baggett and the uh, pianist Kevin Korth. And I managed to go up and make it at the uh, Skywalker Ranch, George Lucas's wonderful place in San Rafael, California, with Grammy-winning engineer Leslie Ann Jones. And uh, it should be coming out on the Delos label um, by the end of 2018 this year. And um, please go out and look for it. If you're interested in uh, my music any further, it can be found on the web at posthornmusic.com. And I hope you've enjoyed hearing some highlights from uh, my varied career in the music business. It's been very rewarding, and uh, I encourage anyone who's interested in it to do it.